Welcome to the Bike Talk with Dave podcast. I'm your host, Dave Mabel. Thanks for tuning in. This week, I'd like to welcome Mason Gravelly, host of the weekly podcast, The Adventure Sports Podcast, where he has conversations with all kinds of folks who've had amazing adventures. In addition to his podcast, he's had some pretty awesome adventures himself, and some of them were on bikes. Can't wait to share his stories with you. He's got great stories, and he is a great storyteller. And he better be because he has just hit episode number 1000 in the Adventure Sports Podcast. So I'm excited for you to meet him, get to know him, and let's dive right into my conversation with Mason Gravely. Gravely? Gravely. Gravely? Gravely. I don't know. We better ask him. Mason, good to see you. Welcome to Bike Talk with Dave. And I didn't say your last name because in <laughs> in the last my last episode I introduced you as, as a future guest. And I'm like, Gravely? 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 I don't know. I'm going to have to ask him. How do you say your last name? It is... Well, the cyclists will appreciate this. Gravelly, like a gravelly path or road or gravel biking. And, uh, but man, I, I'll be honest, I'll accept gravely at this point just because that's about 90% of the, the time how people pronounce and spell it. And so I, I've honestly contemplated just starting to say that and spell it a new way too. I, I, I had to look it up every time I spelled it. <laughs> so yeah, I, I get it. But, I, I do love that it's uh, gravelly, like, welcome to uh, Bike Talk yeah. with Dave, Mr. Gravelly. Like, that's and, perfect. And what funny a perfect, enough, I uh, just, someone pointed this out recently, like, well, you know, Mason is stone worker. I'm like, yeah, that's stone too. I'm like, what the heck am I, I never, of course I know Masons are stone workers and then gravelly. And I'm like, my, my, my middle name is actually a boulder. No, I'm just kidding. It's not, it's a <laughs> <laughs> granite. granite. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be yeah. better. That'd have been a better joke, but uh, that's awesome. Uh, your parents are they into rocks or? No, we live in Florida of all places. So w- a weird thing about Florida is so much of the pl- there's like very few places with, with actual rocks. I didn't grow up with rocks. It was sand and you know dirt and uh, but very like no stones unless they're brought in from somewhere else or there is limestone in a few places, but. Uh, some gravel, but oftentimes it's way down buried. It has to be dug up, but mostly shell. So funny enough, n- we were actually the farthest away from rocks you could get where I grew up. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, I don't know. Your parents had some kind of rock and roll in mind when they named you. I I, I don't know. Yeah, that, I, kind uh, of fun. Yeah. It's, I don't know what they were thinking. And anyway, I appreciate you coming on. And you are here to talk about, you have a, you host a podcast, the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm going to talk to you about that here in a little bit, but uh, I wanted to have you on because you just announced you hit a thousand episodes and you're looking forward to a thousand more. And you're like, Hey, if anybody uh, can help us spread the news, spread the word, spread the love of the adventure sports podcast i'd love the help and i was like ah, i'm gonna reach out see if he wants to be on my podcast and talk about his podcast so here you are and you also have some biking uh chops so we'll talk about that too yeah, but I had uh, some biking chops i, I had ex- some biking chops <laughs> oh come on you know how to ride a bike still i do don't I have you? the mountain bike club that i ride a lot ridge riders uh i do some mountain biking i prefer road or, or gravel and touring but I was like, I'll put this on for the interview. So I'll represent. Perfect. Ridge riders. I don't, I, you're in Florida. What ridges are there? Is it a, like a dike around Miami that you ride or? <laughs> I, I actually do. What's think a, that where's there a ridge? Them. All right. So he, speaking of everything we were talking about, geology, uh, you, you will be on a flat, you know, you'll see a forest and you'll see a parking lot here in Florida and it is way more intense than you realize it's going to be. Nothing crazy like hundreds of feet sustained drops, but I'm, you know, 70, 80 feet is not, is pretty typical. And what happens 
there's an area in Florida that has been mined for phosphate for over a hundred years. And they dig like 60, 80 feet in the ground and then pile those, that overburden into mountains basically. And they leave it and the practices have changed over time. But there's a lot of these places that have been sitting like that for over a hundred years. So you'll have all the vegetation return, all of nature return, and it will look like the Appalachian Mountains. I'm not even joking because my family's originally from that area. You look like you're in the foothills and you can get some serious mountain biking. And, and they've taken a lot of those locations and done some pretty cool stuff with them. So those are the ridges. But here's the thing. You fall off those ridges, you can fall 40 feet and do a lake full of alligators. So it, it, it's a wild place. Oh, Dude, it's right. I, Patagonia. Well, did you were a story. talking me into it. Yeah, Patagonia did a story recently about it because it was just like someone went from their team that and was down here on vacation or something. They're like, "What? This is Florida?" And uh, you would never know it from the road until you get into it. You should look it up. It's it's very unexpected. We'll put it that way. Yeah, uh, sounds kind of fun. Like uh, if you want to shred some mountain bikes, head on down to Florida. You're in central Florida, right? Yes, coastal, kind of just south of Tampa, Tampa Bay area. Oh, pretty. Oh, yeah. I, I, we, we enjoy that area. Where do you like sure. to go? Uh, in Florida yeah. or anywhere? In Florida? Uh, where did we go? <laughs> um, oh, Treasure Island. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll be there tomorrow. I'm, I'm just south of there. No yeah, way. I'm doing a... For the brewery I work for, I'm doing an event there um, tomorrow morning. Oh, dig it! To hand out some some brews. Uh, what are you doing? And you can talk about the brewery because <laughs> that's what it you is. Do that. You know, right now it's dry January. I don't. I think we can't say that actually. It's you know it's a month that people don't drink. You know, to start the year off, and so we're we're definitely trying to make sure we capitalize on awareness. And so I'm going to a 5K, and it's right there on the island. They're running up and down the beach, and I'm just going to hand out free non-alcoholic beer and uh you know it sounds like a fun day right go on the beach hand out beer to people and and it's can't, uh, can't beat that. Like the, nothing it's wrong with that a little chilly for us but that's okay oh uh, we did talk a little bit about the weather a minute ago um and i want to come back to that but uh athletic brewing can we say that sure yeah uh yeah you uh you work for athletic brewing and uh make all kinds of quite frankly delicious non-alcoholic beers yep anybody out there that might be thinking what non-alcoholic beer give it a shot because it, it's gonna you know i'm not bashful in saying that it's probably some of the best beer you'll ever try uh and there's no alcohol that's the crazy thing and, and um yeah it's it's really neat because it, it you know we spend all day you know pushing out this idea that's, that's really fascinating and unique and and it's working um and it just gives everybody on the team the liberty to just do crazy things and think, you know, independently and creatively. And uh, we've done big bike tours through the brewery. We once did a cross country bike ride coast to coast. We rode from our New York, not New York, sorry, Connecticut brewery, which is just outside of New York City. We rode all the way to San Diego. That was in 2020. Wow. And uh, so there is some like adventure and, and cycling chops from the team, too, which is cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I was introduced to Athletic Brewing at the Rattlesnake Gravel Grind. I think you guys sponsored it or whatever the case. He had a cooler full of Athletic Brewing and it was delicious. And I found it, I mean, I'm going to be uh, transparent here. I found it helpful at our tailgates. You know, I would throw in some uh, a wide variety of beers and I'd throw in a case of athletic brewing and I'd alternate and it would allow me to not be stupid for <laughs> deeper into the day. It was actually a, a great idea. Vary. My wife was very happy that's with awesome. me. Well, yeah, hey, that's what we love. We love just being in the cooler with everything else. Um, you know, 80% of the people that drink athletic also drink alcohol. They just use athletic to pace or to, you know, not drink maybe the night before a big ride or a big race. Like, Hey, I want to go out with friends cause they're in town, but I also, we got to get up at four or five and, you know, we want to be able to do both. There's so many reasons. And yep. so me personally, I kind of, I still enjoy alcohol, but you know, I kind of save it for the weekends. I've got little kids. Uh, so there's gotta, it's gotta be the right occasion for me to have a beer. Um, but for the, all the times I'm like, I really want one, but you know, maybe, 
maybe it's not the best night. I'll just re- I'll just grab an athletic. It makes it easy, uh, and and it, and it scratches yeah, that itch it, most of the time for me. Yeah, for sure, and it tastes great. It tastes, I mean, it tastes yeah. like beer, I, dude. That's the thing. It and and like sometimes beer. I'm like, I want one good beer, and I'm like, what's the best thing I got in my fridge? And I'm I have to time it. I mean, it's athletic. It tastes better than what I got anyway. So, sorry, my dog's walking around. Let me see if I. I think he's going to go lay in his bedroom. Well, not his bedroom, our bedroom with his bed in it. But I love that sound, okay. so no worries at all. I love that sound. Bert, lay down. Um, I, <laughs> uh, good dog, good dog. Um, uh, I, we were going to talk about the weather. I sent you a clip. I don't know if you got it of what I was doing like 45 minutes ago. Tell me what the weather is where you are right now. Oh my gosh, man. It's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. It's cloudy and uh, it's 75 degrees. <laughs> Get my violin yeah. out. Yeah. Man. What's it like where you are? We are, we are getting buried. We've got literally blizzard warnings, 10 inches of snow overnight and uh 45 mile an hour wind temperatures like 14 and dropping all day. It's going to be a high of like four tomorrow and a high of negative five the day after that lows of 15 20 below actual temps so you and i are like 180 degree opposite probably 180 degree difference actual temperature maybe not quite yeah close to it it's at least 75 near about i mean if it's going to be negative four or something (laughs) and and, uh you know it's been cold and rainy here for the last few weeks which is unusual this time of year it's usually very dry and sunny it's like our dry season but it has been raining and uh I'm, i feel terrible for the people down here trying to get out of the weather to enjoy time on the beach and granted it's warmer but still you know a 50 degree day on this in this salty air uh moist air can really feel cold and especially with the wind so yeah. Gets into yeah, your bones. yeah, it, it, it is, and I and I came from out west. I lived in Colorado for for a while, and man, that that dry air, it could be, it could be, well below freezing, and if it's sunny, you're hot. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter yep. what temperature it is. If you're out in the sun, it's hot. So you could be biking, taking layers off, and on a on a fat tire. You know what I mean? Like out in the snow. It's it's really bizarre how it all depends. Well said. It all depends, doesn't it? (laughs) Well, we're going to talk about your podcast, but I want to talk about you. Um, It's called Bike Talk with Dave, so we got to talk about your bike ride. I know you've ridden your bike a fair bit. Uh, you got your Ridge Riders uh, mountain bike uh, cap on there. But you had a huge adventure a a while ago, and I want to hear all about it. You rode from um, nearly the Arctic Circle. (laughs) to nearly the tropic of is it cancer or capricorn what's the one on the north oh gosh i i don't know but yeah one of them one well of them. one of the cancers um, from <laughs> from fairbanks to florida uh, what prompted that how what were the circumstances that made that thing seem like a good idea that's a great question uh, being young and dumb helped a lot and uh Fair enough. I'd say the other was uh, completely naive. That helped a ton. Um, And then also just a little bit of delusion helped too. And I'd say all those mixed together was all the ingredients we needed to do pull that off. And now really it was my roommate and I, we were in college and and he, uh, he was graduating. I had a couple years left and we were becoming really good friends and just wanted to do something. He's like, I should, he goes, we should do something this summer. And he's like, I just, you know, we're getting ready to graduate before I start work uh, or a career. And we were thinking about like the Appalachian Trail or something, but I'm like, I, I got to fit something in the summer because I got to come back into school and I don't want to, you know, take a break because uh, I might never, not ever get started again. And uh, we looked at the world map on our wall that we had, we, we got from a yard sale for like $2 and half the countries that, I mean, there's so many countries that were on that map that don't exist anymore or countries that are new that aren't, weren't on that map. It was very old. It was a cool map, but it was perfect for like a, a dorm room apartment type thing. And uh, 
I, he's, he goes, how far away can we go from home and bike back? And I'm like, I mean, Alaska is about as far as you can get looking at the map. And he said, how far is that? I'm like, I don't, this is right before smartphones. Actually, smartphones were out. We were just broke. So we couldn't afford one. And he said, let's go to Alaska and bike all the way back. I bet we could do that in the summer. And so we just started, we, we agreed right there we were going to do it. And I, he, I remember him saying, we got a 20% chance this is happening. And I said, I'm going to the library right now and researching because we, we didn't have, even have internet in our apartment. So um, I go to the library, it's really close. And I just start looking it up, 5,500 miles, give or take, uh, looking at bikes. We don't have bikes, by the way, we're not cyclists. We both played basketball for the team at the college. It's a small school and, uh, you know, we weren't like crazy athletic, but we were college athletes. So fairly fit. We thought, yeah, we can, we can do this. And, you know, if we leave after school in early May, you know, it's 95 degrees here. It can't be that much colder in Alaska. And so we said, (laughs) they're still skiing. Yeah, yeah, I know that now, but, uh, yeah, it ended up snowing on us for over half that trip. But anyway, we, we committed, this was right around Christmas break. We were going to leave in May. And I remember telling my mom in the library, and uh, I don't know why I was on the phone with in the library. You shouldn't do that because you're supposed to be quiet. You shouldn't. And I was do like, that. Mom, we're uh, this is what I'm gonna do. She's like, the hell you're doing that. You're not doing that. <laughs> and I said, and Oh like, wow, oh, yeah, we're gonna do that. And and she's like, I, you could hear her yelling through the phone back at me. And. Uh, <laughs> Oh, nobody thought it was a good idea. I remember one of my mentors, probably one of the closest people to me. We joke about it now. And he, I, I kind of worked part-time for this guy. And uh, he was young as well, a little bit older than me, a couple years out of school. And I told him, he goes, that, man, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That is so stupid. And th- when he told me that, I said, oh, I'm doing it now. Like, there's nothing that's going to stop me now. I had an uncle tell me it was dumb. I mean, very few people other than other completely delusional college students were like, this is really cool. So we just started planning. Um, And and by planning, we just started telling people about it and going to bike shops and uh, going to yard sales because we we literally were looking at yard sales for the bikes we were going to use. And up until literally two weeks before we left, I had bought my bike for $15 at a yard sale and Paul's was a little, it was a 1972 Schwinn and yellow. And it was about eight inches too short for me. I mean, it was small frame. We didn't, when I say we didn't know a dang thing, we didn't know anything. And Paul had bought a fairly, a little bit nicer Cannondale road bike that was at least 25 years old. And it was, I think an aluminum frame and he paid big money for that a hundred dollars. And we, we did a practice ride one day. We went over a set of railroad tracks and he literally bent his rim and we had to get that fixed. Yeah. And it was just, it was chaos, man. It was absolute chaos. But all that changed about two weeks before the trip. Let me tell that story real quick. For okay. sure. Yeah. I'm a hundred percent intrigued. Like this episode is all about your trip from Alaska <laughs> to Florida now. <laughs> and by the way, this was, this was too- I, right, right now. I can't believe you made it out of the Fairbanks city well, limits. I can't believe you would have made it to Fairbanks, oh my gosh, much less yeah. outside the Fairbanks city limits. Well, so all, do tell. All the shout out, I mean, all, all the praise and, and the, the gratitude goes towards a bike shop in Lakeland, Florida, where we were in school, technically Highland City, and uh, it's called Road and Trail. And it was on my, you know, I, I lived about an hour from where I went to school. So I'd go home on the weekends and help my dad work. We, we have a house painting business and, and some small construction cool. stuff. And so contractors. And so I'd go back and help and, and spring break was coming up and uh, it was kind of a later spring break. No, this wasn't spring break. Cause it was literally weeks before uh, we, we left and I was going, it must've been a long weekend. I went home. It's going to help my dad paint a house, get, get some spending money for this trip. And our goal was to save up a thousand dollars each. That's all we needed. And I was, I was only about halfway there after buying the plane ticket that was $400 one way. And by the way, this is 2011. So 12 years ago now, Oh, 13 years ago now. Holy cow. And I'm on my way home. I stop at this bike shop. I've got the bikes in the back of my truck, just 
because I'm carrying them around everywhere. I'm riding them, trying to get used to them. I don't know why I had Paul's as well. Anyway, they were both there. I stopped at this brand new bike shop. They had just opened uh, it, about a month or two before. And I walk in and I'm looking, I'm like, you have any touring gear or any uh, panniers or saddlebags, anything like that? Brook saddles. I, I, I was doing research, getting familiar. And he's like, no, none of that stuff. Cause you know, it's kind of, you're not always getting inquiries about touring equipment at a random bike shop. Right. And he's like, well, what, what are you doing? Like, why, why are you asking about that? I said, well, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to Alaska to ride my bike back. And there go, really? And I said, yeah. And they were the first bike shop that didn't just totally blow us off as, as, as being idiots, basically. And I told him a little bit about it. And I was trying to raise money to build an orphanage in Africa, in Uganda. And uh, there's a backstory there. I had spent the summer before in Uganda, learned about this orphanage that helped needed help funding. And so that was kind of the connection. And uh, man, I, I left that bike shop or I showed him the bikes. They were in the truck. I'm like, yeah, here's what I'm taking. Might have you. And, and he was just like, oh, okay. And I'm probably in his mind. He's thinking these, these kids are going to die. These kids are going to die out there. For sure. And for sure. You're going to die go home. Like I have a vision in my mind of your, your 1972 Schwinn. Like that was my wife's bike in high school. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it weighed a thousand oh, yeah. pounds. And I incredibly heavy. I did. We did. Can't imagine. We did do an 80 mile practice ride on those bikes. And, uh, well, 40 miles one way slapped and came back the next morning and, uh, it was tough. It was very tough. We made it and, um, it was, it was, it was like, okay, we're, we're planning to do, do it on these. And we go home, we come back, I'm going back to school on Monday morning classes. We're a little later and I'm like, you know what? I'll stop back by that bike shop. And I walked in and the guy who, the owner, Jason, he goes, holy cow, man. He goes, I, I, I'm so glad to see you. I had no idea if you were going to come back before your trip. And he said, I had no contact information. I just knew your first name. And he's like, and I was just hoping you'd come back in. And he, he was a, a religious man. And he, he said uh, that <laughs> at church that Sunday that he had seen my face flash in his mind during church. And he felt that, you know, he was, told by God to give me bikes. And I was like, wow. Okay. And he said, so I'm going to give you two bikes. And I mean, this was a complete turn of events. As you can imagine, we were going no matter what, but he goes, I'm going to give you some brand new touring bikes. They're basically like road bikes, steel framed, stronger components all around and, you know, racks and all that. And he's like, I'm just going to give them to you but we need your sizes because they're not here. Like we got to order them and get them built ASAP, like in within a matter of days. And so I said, Paul, get your tail up to this bike shop right now. I've got, we got some big news. And so they took our measurements. Gosh, by the end of the week, the bikes were sitting there put together and uh, we were able to ride them once before putting them together, you know, packing them back up and uh, taking them to Alaska. And so that's how we got our bikes. Wow, that's amazing! You didn't even ask for them. Didn't ask. No, I, 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 I don't know why. I, I, I had, I had asked other people, and just didn't feel good about it. I don't know why. I, see, I'm not against asking for what you need for something if you need a sponsor. I have asked since, you know, for things that I was in need of, especially in college and um, when doing big adventures. But that one in particular, yeah, I didn't ask. It just was provided, and so, you know. That gave me the confidence and my, I think my family, the confidence to, to say, okay, you know, at least they have good bikes and something about this feels very right. Um, and feels like the right thing to do. So not a week later, we're on planes to Alaska and I'm looking out and it's May, you know, first week of May, two days after school gets out. And I'm looking out the window as we fly over the Canadian Rockies. And uh, cause we had, you know, a handful of, and we almost didn't make it. We got stuck in Seattle. We, we, we went for a 15 mile run in Seattle to go to this restaurant that Paul had seen on TV. We almost didn't make our flight back. It was very dumb, very, very 20 year old thing to do. And uh, in the middle of the night, it was this 24 hour restaurant. And I think they're closed now. And uh, not cause us, cause we, we, we ate about 15, 15 eggs that night at that restaurant. And uh, 
Anyway, we get, we're flying to, 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 to Alaska, and I look out the window and see the Canadian Rockies covered in snow, not, a, not an ounce of, of rock showing, and I thought, we're about to be in the middle of that. And I look at Paul, and I said, Paul, I, do you know how to even change a flat tire? And he goes, oh. I, you know, I never looked it up. He goes, do you? I said, no, I don't know. how. To, I know we got a patch kit. I've never used one. And we both, and then we reassured each other and said, well, maybe we won't have a flat tire and we won't have to worry about it. <laughs> within the first 5,500 miles, within right. the first hour of the trip, we had two flat tires. So we learned very quickly how to patch a tire. And so, yeah, that's, that's how it you started. had to, how long did that take? Was that 20 minutes, the 30 first minutes? The one was an hour. An hour. Because we didn't know wow. where the patch kit was. Everything was strapped to everything. Yeah. We were right next to this Air Force base that jets were flying. We couldn't hardly hear a thing. It was snowing as well. And they were uh, there was a, a group of moose nearby. I mean, there was logging trucks left and right, massive RVs. And it's just like, it immediately set in, what, did, what are we doing? And we patched the tire, start going immediately get another flat and we forgot to check the tire for something like a foreign object and that's sure. exactly what it was it was a small piece of you know wire from it from a semi tire something that had punctured just a small hole and, and it was enough to go flat very very quickly but we learned very fast and just kept moving our, our racks there was a there was actually a, a, a poor design with one of the racks the bolts were too long going into uh, the racks and all four of the racks bolts going into our frames broke at, at various points. So our racks were comp completely held on with zip ties within the first week and a half, oh two weeks of the trip. They have since fixed that design, but that was our only option because we don't have tools out there. The bolts literally broken off into the frame. So we just have to figure it out. And that was just the theme of the trip, figure it out. And it was a valuable lesson. And I, I tell people like, you know, I went on that trip as a boy. I came back a man and uh, I just felt complete. I mean, I ter literally turned 21 on the trip. So I, it was a very, uh, very much a coming of age experience. And it is something I have two sons now. They're, you know, four and two. So we've got a while, but they will be doing something like that to transition symbolically into manhood. I don't know what it is. But we're going to do something like that because that was, you know, changed the course of my life for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's the definition of the word adventure. <laughs> Dumb, naive, uh, a new bike a week before you leave, don't know how to change a flat. Like that is how you define adventure for sure. I, I juxtapose that with... Uh, I was just going to say I'm planning a little adventure of yeah. my own, but I can't even call it an adventure now because I'm planning it. Uh, in a year, I'm doing 135 miles on the Arrowhead Trail doing the uh, winter fat bike ultra. And uh, geez, man, it's like I'll have a college degree in winter fat biking before I even show up to International Falls, Minnesota. Yeah. And yeah. it's 180 degrees opposite of your trip from 5,500 miles from Florida, from uh, Alaska and, and to Florida. I'll tell you this, man. How I, far I'm would not, you... I don't, that's not how I think and act now. Like that was then, and it was just a very unique time of life where you just feel invincible. You know, you, now I'm, oh my gosh, I've actually talked a lot with my wife about it. I'm so much more risk averse. Maybe it's just being a dad or just having responsibilities, but I'm, I'm, I'm almost the opposite in a lot of ways now. So I, I've actually made a, not a resolution, but a, a theme for the year to just be more, not dumb because there was that we were definitely putting ourselves in an unnecessary danger at times. Um, but you know, we didn't have bear spray this whole trip and there were grizzlies came up. I mean, grizzlies came up to our tent all the time and we just rode it out and we'd forget half the time to put our, we just put our bikes pretty far away from our, from our tent. Um, cause there weren't always great trees and, and, and 
man, we, we, we had so many encounters. We never bought bear spray. I remember when we crossed in the Canadian border, uh, the border patrol said, Hey, you know, do y'all have guns or anything? And I was, I was like, no. And he goes, you know, knives or any sort of weapon I said, no, he goes, bear spray. We said, uh, no, he goes, well, damn, you need something. Like he goes, there's grizzlies out here. He goes, I was going to let you take whatever you had just cause you're on bikes. And he goes, I advise you go to the store in town right across the border and get you something. So we walked into the general store and everything's expensive, especially to us because our budget's $500 for two months. And we see a can of wasp spray that was on sale and uh, it was like 50% off. And I said, I'll, you know, that, that, you know, enough of that would stop a bear. Just empty the can on them. And it was eco-friendly wasp spray. So it was in this like green can, I remember. And this was big when like go green was a big thing. So everything was just green washed and it was more or less canned compressed vinegar because when we were going across the native American reservation, these dogs were everywhere. And this big old dog was chasing us one day and I, I grabbed it and sprayed the dog right in the eyes. And the dog didn't do more than just blink a few times and it was fine. And I actually stopped because I felt bad and the dog was so friendly and I felt, I gave him some food, gave him some water <laughs> and he, he didn't even know that I was trying to hurt him. And I just thought, man, I've been carrying this around for a month in my water bottle cage of all places, just for quick access. And it's absolutely useless. I doubt it would stop a wasp. Definitely. It didn't stop a dog. It ain't going to stop a bear. And, uh, ah, but it was eco-friendly. Yeah, it was eco-friendly. So no, no harm, no foul. And, Man, it was so there, that was unnecessary risk. So I, I would say, you know, we wouldn't, I wouldn't make that decision today, for instance. I carry a GPS tracker when I go do things now. I'm much more afraid. I'm, I'm honestly way more cautious than, you know, my wife and a lot of other parents, too. So, you know, it's all, it's all, it's all different. Well, I tell you what, man. Yeah, you get a, a job, a mortgage, a spouse, a kid, a dog, like, I got to be home tonight. Yeah. I got to be a dad. I got to be responsible. So yeah, that's a hundred percent makes sense. And we all did stupid stuff when we were 20. Oh yeah. Um, but I, I would add the word lucky. I feel like <laughs> luck might've gotten you home too. Yes. A lot of luck. Yeah, absolutely. They're not, not at all skill or anything. Just, just a lot of dumb luck and just sitting on the bike and keeping going. You know, it, it was, uh, Nutrition was atrocious on that trip. We'd had no idea. We'd bonk every day, just trying to, you know, go too hard without eating and staying, you know, hydrating and whatnot. And uh, yeah, man, a lot of life lessons learned, a lot of wildlife encounters, a lot of big, big landscapes, big mountains and absolute, you know, paper maps. We didn't use, we didn't have, you know, electronic maps at that point. Uh, Paul did have, I think, the first generation iPhone. I still had a flip phone and, you know, we didn't really use map or anything on that. It was just an atlas, a road atlas from, I think, Walmart, or maybe it was my dad's old atlas. And we just cut out the states we needed to save weight and uh, made decisions on the fly of where to go, where to stay, where to camp, uh, all that. And there was plenty, plenty of misadventures. And that did continue. We, But it really, what it taught me is just, it got me, the, uh, you know, I got bit by the bug, I guess you could say, of adventure. And so every summer from that point out, including after college, was dedicated to, to finding that feeling again and, and going and doing something uh, usually associated with the cause, but just going and, going and doing things like that. So ended up doing about five more cross-country rides uh, and then guiding one and then just tons of little things in between. But um, I am by no means the most... Uh, uh, I don't have the most incredible adventure resume, but I'm really thankful for the times I was able to go do these things and uh, I will definitely cherish them. And sometimes it frustrates me because I, I, I you know, I, I would forego career building experiences to go have another adventure. And so I think I'm paying for that now about 10 years later, but I don't think I traded for anything at the same time, you know? Tomorrow, are you not handing out beers at a 5K on the beach? Yeah. 
And getting paid for it, yeah. I'd say that's yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'd say you hit the jackpot yeah, right getting there. Getting paid well by right my there. standard. So I mean, it, it's you're right. It is. <laughs> there's so much, so much to be thankful for. And um, but yeah, it, it was it was an that that trip. I always ask the adventurers on my side who have so many trips they've done. Like, what trip was the most impactful to you? Because that's not always the longest or the one you're most known for or the one that's most marketable even like what's what's one that really changed you the most and it's always surprising because it might be the thing they did as a boy scout or a girl scout or it might be the thing they did their first trip they did themselves or it might be the most recent adventure or 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 the one that was the most uh out of their comfort zone because it involved you know some some variable that that isn't in the other trip so for me it was that trip and uh I think for the reasons I mentioned, just growing up so much on it and being being a changed person on the other side. Well, I'm talking to you. You're in Florida right now, so I assume you made it. How long did it take? <laughs> it took about the whole summer, 66 days. And we camped almost every one of those. Days. If we didn't camp, we were invited into someone's home and People, I think people saw two kids on a bike and, and had a lot of compassion. And so we went through a lot of small towns and people would just, you know, offer us their porch or a, a meal or a, a friendly conversation or a cup of coffee because it was very often bad weather and we rode no matter what. And so we just had so many wonderful interactions with, with other humans uh, that I, I'd say that's, that's the other big lesson it taught me is that the world is a lot kinder person to person in a lot in, in a lot better shape than I think a lot of us think it is. And getting out in the world, which is a scary thought, like putting yourself out there, that's what teaches you that wow, 99.9% .9 of people actually have your back, actually will help you in a time of need, and actually will go out of their way to help you. I mean, we had just acts of kindness that still, you know, bring me to make me emotional and make me floor me and uh it's just by people that we had no chance of ever encountering again they just they just saw two people that were doing something and wanted to help yeah i feel like i don't know i listen to a, a fair number of podcasts throughout the week and it may be on yours it may be on some others but uh i hear people are often surprised they may be in a uh, a place where they don't expect people to be friendly and yet they're taken in and uh, treated great and supported and, uh, you know, people are just kind and, and um, I don't know, hospitable. Hospitable doesn't sound nice enough, but our, our great hosts, yeah. you know, you know, somebody walking across the country or walking across Texas or wherever, and you, you might be intimidated by the ranchers and the farmers and the pe big pickup trucks and people are the kindest that they, you could imagine. And I hear that story over and over and over. I, I hear a lot too with our show, especially international that it's sometimes people are aware of how their country or regions perceived to other countries. And so they overcompensate or try to, and it's almost, the countries that you think would be the most dangerous or, or the m most unfriendly actually end up being because most people are trying to change that narrative. And so they're like, mm -hmm. Hey, here's a week's worth of food here. You can stay here. We like, and it's not insincere. They want to change that narrative because they know it's not, not true or that that conflict or that issue is extremely isolated into one area but they know that the world doesn't know that, you know, like, I, I mean, I get that living in Florida, we get made fun of left and right by the rest of the country and world. And I didn't realize that till I left. Um, but I'm like, whoa, that's, you know, but yeah, there's that stuff, but it's, it's only right there. It's only way over there on the other side or this one area or, you know, it's so misrepresented. And so I, I try to make sure I keep that in mind when I start developing, uh, almost a complex around an area and uh, people don't believe me. My last cross country bike ride, they were like, it was basically New York city to San Diego. And they were like, what, you know, what was the best part? And that was 2020. And I was like, Oh, my favorite experience of the whole trip was through Ohio. 
And people were like, really? And I was like, yeah, it was just so quaint and lush and green. And the people were so kind. It was so peaceful. Like the Grand Canyon was amazing. Yeah, but I expect it to be amazing. The Rockies were incredible, but also really busy. And the weather wasn't great. And, you know, that was an adventure. And it was it was still incredible. But I, I had very low expectations for other areas that ended up just blowing that out of the water. And camping was gorgeous through Ohio. And just, it was just so, it's such a fond memory. And, uh, you know, people don't believe me, They, but I, I'm like, I'm serious. It, it's, you never know, like putting yourself out there, you start seeing all these places in a totally different way. Yeah, for sure. That's interesting. You pick Ohio out of all of the places in between. Yeah, I mean, probably 15, um, I, We states. lived in Ohio for 18, I you said, said? I think we did went through like 15 or 18 states. I mean, all this everywhere was great, but that one stuck out for sure. Huh. That is very interesting. Uh, we lived in Ohio, Cleveland, for um, seven years. And uh, people are like, Cleveland, you? I'm like, huh? It's... We literally went back to Cleveland for our 10-year anniversary because wow. we loved it so much. See, that's what I'm saying. Like, there's great stuff to do in Cleveland. It was super fun. But, yeah, and I can totally picture I, I was into cycling there, and the roads were awesome. Loved getting out. All of the roads that in Iowa would be gravel are all chip sealed. Oh, wow. And so they were remote and rural, and the road riding was just Awesome. That's awesome. Northeast. Yeah. That, see, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. Everywhere is so great. And that's a, that's a big theme on our podcast is adventure and, you know, all that is not Alaska. It's not the, the Himalayas or New Zealand or, or, you know, it, yes, those places are incredible and whatnot, but that, that a list is representing, representing one tenth of 1% of, of where, you can have an adventure and I, I believe you can have one just as impactful anywhere. My, my, my favorite adventures are in the most unassuming places because one, you end up being the only person doing that thing there, which adds an element that I'm looking for, which is isolation and, and, and also not following a guidebook, you know what I mean? So I'm always looking for that element as well as, just, just being very unique for the area and, and discovering what I've never come across. You know, there's so many places that don't make any lists, don't make any sort of uh, uh, guidebooks, but end up being just mind blowing. Yeah, for sure. I've uh, toyed with the idea, and of course, it's just time and energy of doing a video series called Adventures Out Your Back Door mm. because you can find adventure. Today I went, it's blizzard, and um, yeah, I went skiing in my backyard. It was awesome. <laughs> little adventure in my backyard. That is awesome. Nobody was out. I mean, the wind was howling, and uh, felt like I was up in the mountains. Was it cross country? And, and uh, shredding the, uh, no, wow. downhill. I, dude, I was shredding the fresh pow in my right backyard. In backyard. <laughs> that is awesome. It I was love awesome, that. yeah. See, you know, that's, that's what it's all about, is finding it. And then you feel like you have an outlet and have somewhere, you know, I, I hate it for people because I come across it all the time, especially here. They feel like they have to go to the Carolinas or feel like they have to plan this big, expensive, time consuming thing to go feel adventurous and have be fulfilled with nature. I'm like, no, it, I mean, it is it, if there's a blade of grass, that's nature. If there's if there's a tree, that's nature. It's not a disconnected process and in, in system from, you know, a national park. It's the same thing. It's just a small piece of it, but it's the same thing. So when you start seeing that, it, it, it actually, your world goes from being, you know, this concrete jungle full of roads and, and, and electronics and, and, and telephone poles and all that to almost that's the minority. And you start seeing the world as a natural place and noticing the birds, noticing the natural process, noticing the hawk catching the mouse in your front yard or the, the, the all that, all that going on. And it, it really is all around us. It for sure is. And if 
if I were to envision what I picture Central Florida being, it would be Disney and Orlando and Miami and Tampa and, you know, like that. It's highways and telephone pole, everything you just described. <clears throat> but you just had a big adventure of your own uh, stand up paddling across Lake Okeechobee. Say it for me. Okeechobee. Okeechobee. And I know I'm not from Florida. I'm from Iowa. So Okeechobee. Absolutely. Um, uh, tell me about that. Well. And weren't you like the first? You said an FKT? <laughs> uh, yeah, an F- a first known time. I don't know if it's the fastest, but or will be the fastest for long. Well, if it's a first, it's a fastest. Technically. So, you know, I'm sure natives have paddled. I mean, I, I know for a fact natives have paddled that lake for, for millennia. Whether or not any went directly sure. across the middle. I'm sure I'm sure a few accidentally did, um, but as far as, as far as us, first ever to stand up paddleboard for sure, and, and maybe one of a couple that have ever paddled in general, but on shorter routes. Like so, we went, yeah, man. And just to comment on that real quick, oh my gosh, you, I've been to some of the be- most beautiful places in the world, and I talk to people every day on the Adventure Sports Podcast that have gone and done incredible things. Central Florida, Florida in general, it is as breathtaking and brilliant and, and it's, it's, I could spend my entire life adventuring within this state and be completely satisfied. That's how much there is that you don't realize until you get into it. And then it's everywhere because we don't have those very obvious mountains that are off in the distance from every part of town. You can see them and say, that's where the mountain, like that's where wilderness is. Here, you can only see right immediately around you. Other, um, There actually are some very big open vistas, surprisingly, but it becomes this, I mean, it's like a treasure hunt. You, you find a river, you find a spring. Like that's one thing people don't realize. We have over a thousand freshwater springs in Florida that look like aquariums and, and they're huge. They're, they're where most of our drinking water comes from. The, the largest, I think 10, Freshwater springs in the world are in, right here in Central Florida. And you go out in the woods and these ancient 3,000-year-old cypress trees that are big around as a house, and they they go, I mean, they're huge, and they're in this water that looks like it's, it looks like something Disney built, and it is completely natural, and it's been there for thousands of years, and there's so much evidence of human life there. It, it is magical. And, and as, as sacred as a cathedral and just that kind of awe when you walk up into one of these springs just out in the woods. And there's so much of that. And, that. and that's anywhere you go that you start to get to know a place is that magic. But yes, Lake Okeechobee is this huge, it's called a traditionally Lake uh, Peheoke, which basically just means big water. It was the Seminole or the, the tribal name for big water. And it's a, a lake about 35 miles across. So you can't see across. It looks like the ocean. It's right in the middle of the state, southern portion of the state. And it's that blue dot yeah, right in the middle of the see that big blue dot on the southern kind of third. That's Lake Okeechobee. And it is the 10th largest lake in the country. Um, obviously, the Great Lakes are far larger, far larger. Those are inland seas, basically. And so it's a big lake. And it is the main source of water for what's called the Everglades, which is, I think, the largest natural or protected natural area east of the Mississippi River. And it is, I mean, I, I can't even, there's nothing that compares to the Everglades. And I mean, it's, it's up there with any, anything on the national park list. It's incredible. And all it is, it's a, it's a river the Everglades is a river about 100 miles wide, and 60 miles wide, 100 miles long. So imagine a river that deep that was 60 miles wide and just flowed 100 miles south. And it all starts at Lake Okeechobee, and it's so big. It never, the, the lake itself never had a southern shore. The water would just flow into this just v- savanna of grass and trees and life. Well, Gosh, 80 years ago, 100 years ago, we built a big old levee around the whole lake to protect ourselves from uh, from hurricane damage. 
um, because any time a hurricane went through, it would just absolutely demolish the area. The lake basically became a, a giant wave that would crash villages and kill thousands of people. I think the second largest natural disaster in U.S. history uh, is Lake Okeechobee hurricane that killed almost 3,000 people in one storm. Really? And uh, I think that record, huh. I think it was maybe the second at the time. I think it's been surpassed, unfortunately. But anyway, there's a huge push here in Florida to protect as much of it as possible um, because it is so unique. It's so, uh, Florida gets so many people moving to it. Over a thousand people a day move to this state. And it's not a very big area compared to, you know, some of the Midwest states and some of the states out West. Um, and so the lake is a really important piece of that conservation effort because it provides a lot of the water. Water is so critical here to Florida. And so no one had ever done it. I said, hey, you know, for this year, I want to do it. And I kept getting reminded throughout the year, you know, 2023, I want to paddle across Lake Okeechobee. I want to paddle across Lake Okeechobee. And the end of the year is getting close. I'm like, I don't know if I can do it. Well, I saw him like, man, the last year, the last day of the year is next week. And I looked at the weather and I'm like, man, it looks perfect. And I told my buddy that I, I didn't want to do it alone. Um, because it, and here's the other thing, there's, there's an estimated 30,000 alligators in Lake Okeechobee, which is 10 times oh more boy. than any other lake. It's just an, it's a gator haven, uh, big for fishing. I mean, it's just tons and tons of wildlife, millions of birds just on this lake all the time. And, uh, I didn't want to do it alone. So I told my buddy, I said, Hey, do you think Sunday you could go? And he goes, let's do it. And I said, all right, let's, let, let's plan on it. And so we started at the, the, the North shore. And got in the lake, and you, I mean, it's pitch black, but I've been to that lake before, and you just look, it looks like you're at the beach. Like, it, that's just, like, like at the Great Lakes. And we just pointed our board south, five in the morning, the wind was howling, didn't see a soul, and for about the next 12 hours, we were headed directly south to the southern shore. And uh, it was it was an awesome time, man. It was not, obviously, a 60-day trip like I've done before. I, I mean, my longest adventure was five months on bike. And that was amazing and impactful and, and, and changed my life. But this 12 hour experience, 24 hour spirit experience door to door, I was, I only missed one night with my kids was every bit, every bit as exciting and, and scary and, and adventurous and tapped into that same thing for me as a five month trip. Like, I don't know how to explain it. And so I just was like, and what's cool is, I have the energy to talk about it afterwards because those other trips, I was so dang tired at the end. I, I wouldn't speak for a week about it. I just, you're exhausted. You're mentally just done. Now the press has picked it up and I've almost had the energy to respond to that stuff. So I like the format and it, it really scratches that itch, which is cool. Huh, that's awesome. 12 hour, 24 hour adventure right out door yeah. to door. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. We, it removes one of the many excuses we all come up with to say no. Time. You know what I mean? Yeah, the time. It's not a 60-day. I don't have to commit to all freaking year to do the Appalachian Trail. It's not a month long of the Tour Divide. It's 24 hours. You're going to be gone 24 hours, and I can do exactly. that. Exactly. We can all find that. That's awesome. Well, dude, we've been chatting for 50 minutes and we have not, other than alluding to your podcast, I, I want to talk about your podcast uh, a bit. Uh, Adventure Sports Podcast, first of all, a thousand episodes. You didn't start it. You moved in, I don't know, halfway through? Yes. So um, I was a guest originally. How, how did you... Uh, how did you, you were a guest originally? Yeah. Oh, you go, you finish your question. Sorry. I cut you off. <laughs> well, uh, I'm curious how you ended up uh, hosting it, but um, I feel like you could be a guest on a freaking dozen episodes of it. <laughs> I was a guest twice. So yeah, they, they, they like to, there, there you go. They like to uh, make sure they, yeah, there's, there's so many guests on that show that it's like, Hey, you've got 20 things we could talk about. Let's pick one. Cause that's, it's, it's easier to focus yep. on one and then, you know, we'll have you back on again to talk about, we could literally interview the same person 
20 times, uh, many yeah, times. I don't know how many times I've heard you say, oh, we'll have to have you back again and talk about this one or that one. Why? You know, so yeah, yep, we just yep, get so much sure. inbound that I, it's, it, I don't, sometimes I do follow up with folks or we do talk eventually. I, I've had, you know, repeat for sure, but um, there's so much out there that I hardly lack any sort of inbound uh, stories to tell just because so many people, one, want to be on the show and two, um, there's always just so many exciting things people are doing, but yeah, so I was a guest back on in 2014, I believe. And at the time I was trying to climb all the Colorado 14ers in one big trip and do that. And, and, and so we talked about one of my experiences and then a year later I was on again, but I really enjoyed being on and, and enjoyed listening. And I was starting to get into podcast and I reached out the second time I was on and I said, Hey, Kurt, uh, you know, I, we, we, we'd come to learn that we live very close together. We were out in Denver, where is where the show was based. And I said, Hey, if you ever need help hosting the show, let me know. And I didn't hear from him for like a month. And I said, Oh gosh, I think I might've offended him. Um, but what I sensed in his voice was just a little bit of burnout. I, I, maybe it was just that day, but I was like, when he interviewed me the second time, I was like, I almost feel like he's kind of tired of it. And maybe that was just the day, you know, not necessarily indicative of this whole experience. And well, it was true. He was like, man, you know, me and me and Travis who were hosting, both of them were kind of the owners of the show. They said, we, this show's changed our life so much. We actually want to go do adventure ourselves. So we want to, you know, move our family further into the mountains. Travis wants to live in a van full time with his family and like travel all around. They want to, we want to do these things that the show's inspired us to do, but that would mean not hosting anymore uh, because it'd be hard to maintain both. And this timing's great. Would you want to just take over the show? And I said, whoa, I did not expect that. And they're like, well, we'll sell it to you. You'll have to buy it from us because we do get ad revenue, but we'll just, you know, we'll, you can pay us off with the ad revenue that you generate till it's paid off and then it's yours. And we'll train you during that time too. And so they made, they gave me such a gracious offer and I, I, they trained me on how to podcast, how to host, how to edit, how to, how to do everything. And, and we just met up like once a week and, and did little things and learn a new skill each week. And about two months later, I was the host and it was a very smooth transition. The show just started growing immediately because I, I was still in my twenties. I had tons of energy and uh, that was, gosh, over five years ago now. So I've been the host for five years and that was episode 410. I think I took over somewhere around there. And now we're at episode almost 1000. Uh, which I, I think by the time this comes out, it'll be episode a thousand. Cause that's, it's literally a week away. So mm-hmm. that's how I took, that's how I became. A um, host. Uh, well, congratulations. You're a great host. I love, well, you're one of my regulars for sure. Um, who's somebody that you are surprised they said yes. I guess. Oh man. One of the things, and I will tell people this, one of the most important, incredible things about podcasts is they give you access to people. People say yes, way more than you think they would. You just ask. And it's because you have something to offer them too. And that's important in today's world because, you know, if you talk to an author who's busy or a public personality, they can't just meet up for coffee with everybody that asks them. But if you've got a way to help them with their mission of getting their work out there, they're more likely going to say yes. And you can essentially ask all the questions you would want to know over coffee anyway. Uh, and you get to basically show off the fact that you got to meet these people. It's a great format. I tell people, anybody looking to network in an industry, start a podcast and you're it, it, be committed to it. And you're going to definitely meet a lot of cool people. How, I mean, how many formats in today's world can you sit down and have a meaningful conversation with someone a thousand miles away in an hour? There's not a lot of formats. I don't think there is one. Correct. So this is my main way of Correct. connecting with people that are that are new to me. You know what I mean? I don't go to bars and hang out or, you know, go to a lot of places. Honestly, life's busy. And a podcast is a great way to do that. But so all that to say, there's been some definitely some people in the in the over the years that have said yes. And I just started asking right away. And I think the first I asked all the people of the the adventure books that I used to read when I was first getting into things. Joe Kermaski was a big one. He wrote Iron Cowboy. Um, Another one is uh, Alistair Humphreys. He was one of my biggest inspirations. He wrote a, and then another guy named Rolf Potts who wrote Vagabonding. 
that was a very instrumental book in my 20s. And all three of them said yes right away. I was, I was my mind was blown. And I'd say the coolest one was, uh, which actually, I mean, I don't, this is a humble brag, but they asked me if, if they could be on was Bear Grylls. That happened last year. And uh, that was an incredible experience that was uh, very uh, surreal and just kind of was validating for the point the show had gotten into. His, his folks said that, he, hey, he's coming to the U.S. for one day for a press tour and we want to start incorporating podcasts into his press tour, but he only wanted to be on one and he chose one and it's yours. So if you're available, he'd love to do the show in person, mind you. And I just happened to be in town in New York that day. And so I got to meet him last spring and, and do an in-person interview. And so, you know, it just takes you to wild places when you stick it out for the long haul. And, and like I said, I didn't plant this seed. I basically bought a, a four-year-old tree, you know, it had a, it had a, a foundation <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it was, fur- it was further along. Coming exactly. out of the ground. So would it have been, you know, maybe more satisfying, but I'm not going to lie. This has been a great way to do it uh, because it was just in the right place, the right time, uh, the right set of uh, skills and expectations. And the last five years has been just awesome. Being able to connect with folks like you and, and talk. But here's the thing, too. As you all probably can hear, I'm a talker to no end. I, I, I yes, come from you a are. family of Southern. We're, we're the mouths of the South, as we call ourselves. And we'll talk and talk and talk and talk. However, as a host, you don't talk very much. A good host, that is. A lot of shows are just an excuse for the host to hear themselves talk. But really good shows that are interviewing people you are listening 95% of the time. If I look at my audio tracks and I've got, and my clips are any longer than 30 seconds at a time, it's too much. And so it's interesting. So if you listen to my show, you're not going to hear me this much. No, but you do send little uh, Easter eggs out, uh, which is kind of fun. And and people do get to know the host as uh, as they continue to listen throughout yes. time, which is kind of yes. cool. You, you, it it, it's, it cool. is an overtime relationship, which I've learned because I've learned that as I listen to certain shows, I'm like, ooh, that host just revealed something that I didn't know. But it, it wasn't a story. It was just a little mention of something. And a, as a listener of certain shows, I love that when they do that. But it's it's something you have to discover I do over too. time. And I also uh, enjoy having podcast hosts on because now I get to ask you about all those little Easter eggs you've laid over the years. Exactly. <laughs> uh, where has hosting the podcast led you that you wouldn't have otherwise done? Oh, man. Um, one thing you got to be careful of as a host hearing great stories or this is at least for me, I, I can get desensitized to how incredible certain things are. Cause I'm like, Oh yeah, I just, I just had someone else that, you know, did the seven summits or, you know, did something crazy and you, and you start downplaying your own life and down, not, not really realizing, wow, this is actually really incredible. And so I'd say a lot of the places it's taken me or a place that's been surprising is, um, really the, just the people I get to talk to, uh, just having the platform, having the process in place, you come across hidden gems quite a bit, like stories that you're like, I can't believe this isn't more well known. And I'd say that's the most cherished moments for me is when I come across someone's story who maybe they don't think it's a good story, or maybe they're very shy or, or, um, they just haven't ever been on a show and then they tell it and it is. I'm like, y'all, you got it. I mean, this is as good as it gets. And and recently, I will say one of those stories was Randy Brandt. Um, He's been a listener for years and we've been messaging back and forth for years. We've talked on the phone a few times, but he's a he's a cop out of San Francisco and he retired and just did some incredible stuff. And he he just so much underplays his his story. Like, man, you are an amazing storyteller. And we recently played that episode. And that was one of my, I mean, that was recent, but also definitely a cherish because it was a, a long-term kind of relationship. And 
uh, to see it all fr- come to fruition as an actual episode. Because that's what I tell listeners. I said, go do something that at some point you'll be a guest on the show. Like that should be your goal. And if you tell me that was, you know, part of your inspiration, I'm definitely going to get you on the show. So that that's the places it takes me that I love. Yeah. Uh, that dude is a great storyteller. Oh, yeah. oh so you've, you've listened. All you had to do was it. I owe oh, for sure. And all you had to do was introduce him and shut up. It, it, perfect and example. an hour went by and I'm like, don't end, don't end, don't end. Because he got talking end. about his When's career. The next... And I'm like, dude, this is so fascinating. Tell me about that. And I, I, I hated to cut it short, but I had work. And uh, I was like, dang it, man. Like, he, he's someone, and, and I love finding those folks because some people, they know they got a good story. They've been all over the news. And they, there's a little bit of an ego there. And those are great. They can be great. But sometimes it is a turnoff. And I love finding those folks that, are underestimating just how great they are. Well, and the beauty of that, like, I'll say, like, I love getting a, a name. Like, somebody who everyone will recognize, be like, oh, Dave got, I'll just say, Ian Boswell, who was yes. a world tour writer, Ian. freaking Tour de France. Um, uh, oh, I want to listen to Ian Boswell, because they, or I got the CEO of... USA Cycling, or I got Dave Ween's uh, International Mountain Bike Association. So some, it's it's great to have people that people will recognize. But some of the treasures are this cop who was a cop, and when he retired, he did amazing things, and he's a great storyteller. Nobody's ever heard of him. Didn't want to be an the on dude the show. could have I, a I series of books like five times. I'm like, you got to be on the show. Randy and he's yeah. like, okay, I'm gonna build up confidence. He said he's so nervous. That's the other thing, man. People are so nervous to be on the show. I had a cowboy one. This is one from my other show. They had a cowboy one time. I'm talking a hard nosed, genuine cowboy. Lived his whole life on the ranch and just out on the range. I mean, this was a man's man, and I had him on the show and it was in person. And I was just doing a little project, a little short interview. And he was shaking. He's like, man, I'm so nervous right now. I'm like, you tackled a cow today. Like, you, you've you wrestled a bull. You've been on horseback in a thunderstorm yesterday. Like, we're just talking. And it, it's just so, I love finding those people because you know it's so genuine and it's so real. And it comes across in the audio. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, listen, I don't know who you got planned for the next thousand episodes. Uh, Do you have anyone who you're dreaming of? Yes, actually. Someone asked me recently, who would would you like to have if you could have anybody? And and, and I'd say a lot of my heroes or the people I look to are, are, are people not doing the biggest adventures, but those who are making a big impact. One of them is the filmmaker, Ken Burns. I would love to have him on and, and hear his story. Oh, wow. I love folks that like love stories and want to bring it to the world in a, in a way that's, you know, free like Ken does with PBS or gives back in a big way. David Attenborough is another one. Um, anybody that's sacrificed a lot or given a lot away, something about that's so compelling. And so, it, you know, I, I'd say the people I'm starstruck by are the folks that start a foundation or, or, um, volunteer a lot and that that become known for that that that's the folks that I, I love hearing from because it's that's what's impressive to me is not you know being really rich a, a dentist that climbs Kilimanjaro or something it's it's incredible to do but just doing it for your own I don't know glory like I I really try to avoid those kind of conversations and you know I, I that's the only two names that really come to mind at the at this moment but um yeah, I've got a few really incredible ones already recorded for a thousand and then like the few after. I, I try to keep a handful already done um, in case I can't record for a little while. And yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for the next thousand. Going to keep it going. Holy moly, man. A thousand in a weekly podcast. You got 10 more years ahead of I'm you. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. It's... Uh, <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. It, it, it's unbelievable just how 
Yeah, you just keep plugging away, man. And when I scroll through the list we've had over you know, every year, I'm just blown away at the people who have come on to tell the story. And just I just ask them questions. That's all I do from a genuine point of curiosity. Um, you do a great job of it. And I love listening to your podcast and would highly recommend everybody tune in to the Adventure Sports Podcast. Now, listen, it's not... That doesn't mean you have to give up Bike Talk with Dave on your playlist, but add Mason Gravelly and the Adventure Sports Podcast to your uh, to your listening list. Subscribe, whatever, whatever, whatever people, people do to yeah. to put that put that in their queue. But um, I I do really enjoy it, and I've listened for a long time. You had a friend of mine on, Steve Cannon. Oh, yeah. Uh, he did the, uh, I did a rod trail on a bike. Dang, this is great. Yeah. I really, uh, enjoyed getting to know you and hopefully we, um, run into each other in person sometime. Absolutely. Maybe I'll come down and run a 5k on the beach and you can hand me a beer. <laughs> we'll be here tomorrow morning at nine <laughs> and, uh, I'll be there. I'm on my talking. You'll hear uh, me. Dude. Before you see me. <laughs> dude, it's going to be negative three here. So I am on my way. <laughs> it's not going to be perfectly sunny, but it'll, it'll definitely be a lot warmer than Put put a six in front of that at least, maybe a seven. Uh, dude, that'll be a heat wave for sure. Oh man, well stay warm and thank you so much. And uh, yeah, just let me know if you need anything else. I'm happy to give it to you. All right, I appreciate that. And uh, Adventure Sports Podcast, Mason Gravelly. Awesome, thanks, Dave. I could talk to that guy for hours. I really appreciate him taking the time to sit down and chat with me. And I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. And if you did, you should definitely check out his show, The Adventure Sports Podcast. It's on all the podcast platforms, and he just published his 1,000th episode. A great conversation with British adventurer Alistair Humphreys. And just a couple episodes before that, he published an episode dedicated to his New Year's Eve paddle across Lake Okeechobee, which we just heard about in Florida. Check him out. Something else you should check out is the Core 4, a challenging ride across all surfaces in August. Paved roads, gravel roads, single track mountain bike trails, even grass. Check it out. Who's ready for some Core 4 news? After a huge spike in riders and a super thank you to everyone for coming out this year, these guys jumped right back into the fire. It's no surface untouched again for 2024 because Core 4 24 has a sweet sound to it, no doubt. New routes, new distances, and a new you. That's right y'all, they are mixing it up with more surprises and delights. New for 24 is the Core 40 distance. Just a bump up from the 20 mile and still has all the farmscapes and B roads and champagne gravel you'd expect from the folks at Core 4, just without the single track. They're telling us 60 is the new 50, miles that is. It's a no-surfaced, untouched, podium-eligible route with all the cats in addition to their marquee 100-mile event. It's the perfect blend of competition and community. We want Core 4 to be on your event calendar for 2024. Jump on Bike Reg today, snag your spot before this event reaches its cap. Come ride the wave and get more bodies on bikes. It's blazing hot action every year, and they'll keep the fire stoked all winter long with the 20, 40, 60, or 100 mile route. Core 4 24 has something for everyone. It's time for the next time. Let's go. My next ad is what I like to call guiltless self-promotion. I've formalized what I've been doing freelance for more than a decade, and I feel like I'm getting pretty darn good at it. So check out my little ad here.
Mabel Media, an award-winning film, photography, and podcast company that can help you reach the top. Whether you need a 30-second spot to tell your story on the evening news, photos for next year's catalog, social media clips, or maybe you need your podcast produced and edited, Mabel Media is here for you. With more than a dozen years in media, our resume runs deep. An award-winning feature-length film company, podcast production, live video streaming, and stunning photography, our only objective is to provide you the tools you need to reach the summit. Check it out at MabelMedia.net. Well, I hope you dug it, and if you do need any photo, video, or audio help, be sure and connect with me at mablemedia.net. In the meantime, thanks tons for tuning in. I'd love your help in growing this podcast, and I've got some fun episodes coming up, including a chat with Justin McCrary and Joe Laverick, a couple of hardcore roadies hitting the gravel at the Rattlesnake Gravel Grind in Texas in March. Now, I really appreciate you tuning in each week, and I would really love it if you would rate and review this show on your favorite podcast platform. And if you want to support the show financially, just look for Bike Talk with Dave at buymeacoffee.com and drop a few coins in the cup. If you do, I'd be happy to send you a sticker. And be sure to check out the Bike Talk with Dave channel on YouTube, where you can watch not only every episode, but some of our award-winning films, including, and this is winter appropriate, A Thousand Miles to Nome and Down the Kuskokwim, my stories about the Iditarod Trail in 2019. In the meantime, stay warm, enjoy your rides, and remember that nothing compares with the simple pleasure of riding a bicycle.